In this video, I'm going to discuss crystallization, which is a process used for purifying a sample. Sometimes you'll see it called recrystallization, but that can also mean just doing multiple crystallizations. And so I will be calling it crystallization. So this is using the solubility differences at different temperatures to purify solids. And so in the previous video on solubility, I ended by talking about how the heat or the temperature can affect the solubility of these things. And so we have this temperature term right here in our solubility constant. And so that means that the solubility is affected by the temperature. So the general technique that we're going to use for this is to dissolve material to be crystallized in hot solvent and then we cool the solution slowly. The dissolved material has decreased solubility at lower temperatures and will separate from the solution as it is cooled. So this is called crystallization if it's slow, precipitation if it's fast. And so solubility and temperature, as I said, generally substances are more soluble at higher temperatures and can be determined by the thermodynamics. Where in the previous video, I ended off by talking about this, where we have our KSP here, which is our solubility constant, and it's proportional to this E to the negative 1 over T, where the negative just means we put it here in the denominator, but this T is in the denominator inside a denominator. So as T goes up, this exponential here will get smaller, and therefore this whole term here will get larger. And so as temperature goes up, so does the solubility here. And so the steps for crystallization in a little bit more detail here. So the first thing to do is to select an appropriate solvent. So we want a solvent that will dissolve the substance at a high temperature, but not at a low temperature then we want to dissolve the substance of interest in the solvent, and then we want to reduce the solubility. So a common technique for that is by cooling the solution, but there are a few others that I will talk about here in a little bit. Then we crystallize the substance, so these two things are kind of happening at the same time. Then we want to filter the substance and collect the solid, and then optional, we can do recrystallization. So we redo steps two through five here with the collected solid. And if we do that, we can further purify the substance. We can get a more pure substance, but this will lower the yield somewhat every time you do this. And so to go through this in even more detail, so when we are selecting a solvent, we want one that is going to look more like this green one here. So we want it to be our solute to be very soluble at a higher temperature over here, and then very insoluble at a lower temperature over here. And so these are the curves for the solubility of a given solute in multiple different solvents. And so we can look at an actual example of that over here. So this is aspartame in these different solvents here. So we can look at it in water, methanol, ethanol, then in 50% methanol, 50% water, and 50% ethanol, 50% water. And that's something quite common when doing this as well as using those mixed solvents there, which I will talk about here in a little bit. And so we see that these have different solubilities at different temperatures. But this one that's 50% ethanol, 50% water, the aspartame is very soluble in it at high temperatures and then very insoluble in it at lower temperatures. So that would probably be our best choice here, where the pure ethanol right here, these blue triangles, is very insoluble even at high temperatures and at low temperatures. And so Solvent A in here is ideal crystallization solvent, as I said. So very soluble at high temperatures, very insoluble at low temperatures. So we want this large change in solubility over a relatively small change in temperature. Solvent B here in yellow is okay, but not ideal. So this is somewhat soluble at these higher temperatures and very insoluble at low temperatures. 
then solvent C and D are both poor crystallization solvents. So we see that solvent C here is very insoluble at all temperatures, where solvent D is very soluble at all temperatures. And so in solvent C, the substance is too insoluble at all temperatures. And so solvent C can be used as an anti-solvent, which I will talk about here in a second, but solvent D, the substance is too soluble at all temperatures and will therefore not crystallize. So when choosing a solvent, do not select one whose boiling point is higher than the melting point of the substance to be crystallized because this can cause it to do what they call oiling out. So it liquefies, it separates, and it fails to crystallize. So these are some common crystallization solvents. I mean, these are common solvents that you'll use in organic chemistry, period, but these are also common crystallization solvents. So water, diethyl ether, acetone. We have our various carbon chlorine things right here. We have methanol, ethanol, toluene, ethyl acetate, and hexane. And we also have common crystallization mixed solvents. So these are the things that you often use mixed, things like methanol, ethanol, acetone, diethyl ether, and methanol, and so on and so forth. And so these, like I said, if you are going to be looking for solvents to use in a crystallization, these are probably the ones to look at first before you start kind of going farther afield. So these are ones that are all quite common. So for the mixed solvents, you want to dissolve your substance, your solute that you're trying to crystallize. You want to dissolve that in the hot solvent in which it is most soluble. Then we add the other solvent, so the one that it's less soluble in, until cloudiness, so a precipitate, begins to appear. Then you want to add just a little bit more of the first solvent back into it, just until the cloudiness disappears, because... Ideally, we want this to be as saturated of a solution as possible because we don't want to have it, you know, cool way down before we start getting crystals because then you will still have a lot of your material still dissolved in the solvent. And so this is sort of the thing that you want to try and do when you're using a mixed solvent. All right, step two. So now that we've decided on what solvent to use. Now we actually do the experiment. So we're going to dissolve our solute, our sample here in the solvent. So in addition to the solvent, the temperature, as I said, is also an important factor. So there is a minimum temperature where the maximum quantity of product can be dissolved in a solvent. So after you do an experiment, say, you're going to end up with a certain amount of product you want to use an amount of solvent that just dissolves all of it. You don't want to go beyond that because then after you do the crystallization, some of your product is still going to remain in solution. So when this temperature is reached, the solution is saturated and insoluble impurities may be filtered from the hot solution. You could get it completely dissolved and then do a filtration before recrystallizing in order to remove some other impurities that have not completely dissolved. So step three is to reduce the solubility. And so, like I said, this cooling crystallization is very common. So when dissolved at a high temperature, a large amount of solute can initiate crystallization when the solution undergoes controlled cooling. So that's probably going to be the one that you use most often. But you can also use what's called an anti-solvent. So you will just add something to it, a solvent in which your product is not very soluble in it. And so that will reduce its solubility and cause it to come out of solution as a crystal. You can also evaporate, so you just remove some solvent so that you go below the saturation point and then your product will start to crystallize out. And you can also do reactive, so if you just do a precipitation reaction with it. So step four is crystallize the product. So like I said, step three and step four are kind of the same thing here. So as solubility is reduced, a point is reached where crystals will nucleate and then grow. So the point where crystal nucleation occurs is called the metastable limit. So supersaturation is the difference between the actual concentration and the solubility concentration. So we have temperature here and concentration. And there is this 
darker blue line here, which is the point of solubility, but then this lighter blue line is the metastable limit. So between these two lines is what's called supersaturation. So you're beyond the concentration needed to have it be insoluble, but it remains soluble until it gets to that metastable limit, and then you start having nucleation occur. And so nucleation is when the atoms here or molecules or ions or whatever first start coming together like this. And then we have crystal growth, which is when you just keep adding more of these molecules onto your nucleation point. And so you start forming these larger crystals. And so I actually have some GIFs here of crystal formation. I just Googled crystallization GIFs and found these. And so these are all kind of cool looking. So this first one here, you can see crystals start growing in there as this solution cools down. We can look at this one here. This also shows some cool crystal growth going on right there. And we can then look at this one. So we see some sort of spindly looking crystals start growing inside there. This is probably a super saturated solution. Then it looks like they stuck a probe into it and then that created a nucleation point where those crystals then started forming on that on the end of that probe there. This one, they're actually using their hand as the probe to nucleate it, and you can start seeing the crystals forming around this person's hand. This is probably more what you'll see if you're in an organic chemistry lab, where you put this in an ice bath, and you can see some solids beginning to form in there, usually as a powder. And then, so that powder there is the stuff that you will filter out onto like a filter paper. So yeah, that is crystal growth. And so there is some math to this, as there always is. So primary nucleation, both homogeneous and heterogeneous, has been modeled as follows. So we have this B here, which is the number of nuclei formed per unit volume per unit time, where N here is the number of nuclei per unit volume, and we see that is a time derivative of that. And so we get this here, which is just going to be a rate constant, which is going to depend on the solubility of your product. Then we have the C and C star here, where C is the instantaneous solute concentration. So this is the actual concentration of your solute. Then the C star is the solute concentration at saturation. So this here in the parentheses is the supersaturation. It's how far above the saturation point that you actually are. Then this n here is going to be an empirical exponent. So this says it can be as large as 10, and this is coming from Wikipedia right here. So it can be as large as 10 and generally ranges between 3 and 4. All right, so step 5 then is to filter and dry. So for the majority of crystallization processes, the solid purified particles are the desired product. The crystals need to be separated from what's called the mother liquor by filtration. So gravity filtration or vacuum filtration are the things that you're mostly going to use. And if you do vacuum filtration, you might use a Buchner funnel or a Hirsch funnel, where these two funnels are used for vacuum filtration. The Hirsch funnel is smaller than the Buchner funnel and has a smaller surface area of the plate that holds the filter paper. So the loss of product is less in the Hirsch funnel, but it will tend to take longer than the Buchner funnel. So this is used most when the mass of solid be purified is greater than 0.1 grams. All right, so we can look at an example here of what happens if we do a recrystallization, so doing this multiple times. So say we have a product from a reaction that contains 9 grams of substance A and 2 grams of substance B, and the solubility for both of these is the same. So 1 gram per 100 milliliters at 20 degrees Celsius, and actually this should be 10 right here. I meant to put 10 here, so these are 10 grams per 100 milliliters at 100 degrees Celsius. 
So we assume the solubilities of A and B do not affect one another. So we don't have like a common ion effect or anything going on. So at 100 degrees Celsius, all of both A and B will dissolve in the 100 milliliters of solvent. When the solution is cooled to 20 degrees Celsius, only one gram of each will remain in solution. So that means that eight grams of A crystallizes and one gram of B crystallizes. And so we have helped purify it. So we have a greater percentage of A compared to B, but there is still some B left in there. So we can do a repeated process. We can do a recrystallization by treating the crystals again with 100 milliliters of solvent and doing the crystallization again. We now get seven grams of A to crystallize and zero of B. So we are left with pure A, but we are now at a lower yield. So we've lost another gram of our A here in order to get that higher purity. And so this is essentially what we're doing here. So we have this impure nine grams of A plus two grams of B. We do the first crystallization. We get eight grams of A, one of B. Then we do a second crystallization we are down to seven grams of A, but we've removed all of the B. So it is practically impossible to recover 100% of a desired substance from a crystallization, even if we don't do repeated recrystallizations like this. And the reasons for that is even at zero degrees Celsius, or I guess you know, really cold, depending what substance, what solvent you're using, most substances will still have some small amount of solubility in the solvent. And performing multiple recrystallizations will further purify, but leads to smaller yields. But yields will also be affected by the filtration step, where it is practically impossible to recover all material from the filter paper. There is almost always going to be some residue left on your filter paper. And the yield can also be affected just by having inefficient reactions so that just has to do with the equilibrium of it and whether it's highly product favored or not. So according to this 1996 textbook here, yields close to 100% are called quantitative. Yields above 90% are called excellent. Above 80% are very good. 70% are good. 50% are fair and below 40% are poor. But I always tell organic chemistry students who are taking a sophomore level organic chemistry class that if your experiment gives you something greater than 20%, then you're probably doing just fine. So these things right here are probably going to be more for professional organic chemists. But if you're, this is the first time you've ever done anything of these kinds of procedures, then getting over 20% is probably going to be fine. All right, so just some comments to end out here. So Adding too much solvent will reduce yield and may even prevent crystals from forming. So like I was saying before, you only want to go up to that point where you get a saturated solution. You don't want to go above that because you can prevent crystals from forming and reduce the yield. And so sometimes, like if you accidentally do this, you can fix this by just evaporating some of the solvent off. So a common error is to add too much hot solvent in an attempt to dissolve impurities. So sometimes there might be solid impurities that maybe look very similar to your product crystals and you're trying to add more and more solvent to dissolve them and they're not dissolving away. And so that's something you want to watch out for is making sure that you're not adding too much solvent by trying to dissolve impurities that look like your solvent. So it may be better to lose some product by not adding enough hot solvent than it is to add too much hot solvent. And the other thing, another comment here is do not heat the solid until the solvent is added. Because if you heat the solvent, it might melt and possibly form an oil or decompose, and then you won't be able to crystallize it. So don't try heating it until the solvent has been added. Uh, but anyway, that was everything I wanted to say in this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I will see you in the next one.